Tonight, the Sussex pilots at the forefront of the bombing raids. The voluntary group standing ready to help relatives. And praying for peace, the children learning about war. Good evening. Well, the Gulf War dominates the news tonight, of course, and we'll be reporting on the impact it's having in the southeast. More than a thousand service men and women from the region are involved in the conflict. A number of support groups have been formed to help and advise their fa families. TVS has set up a special regional information service, and we'll have more on that later. As we speak, Allied aircraft are continuing to bomb military sites in Iraq and Kuwait. If there are any major developments while we're on air, we'll bring them to you. But we start our coverage with a family in Sussex. Jane MacDonald knew her husband and her brother were flying in the first wave of tornado aircraft to attack Iraq. She and her family saw they were safe when they appeared on television after the raid. Jonathan Marland reports. Jane watching and waiting to see if her husband of less than six months and brother had flown back safe from their first mission. Parents watching and waiting for the return of a son and a son-in-law. Both recently married, Flight Lieutenants Bruce MacDonald and Nick Hurd were in the first wave to attack Iraq. Then they were seen back safe and well. Hi, Mom. We're back. Yeah. It's not relief that something has happened, but you think, well, at least if, you, if something has started, it's halfway to finishing, and maybe it'll be over in a few days. This anxious family had been up all night, sharing the excitement and fear of the desert airfields. Their relief turned to sympathy as news came in from the second tornado attack. Sadly, one tornado is missing. Uh, its crew reported an engine was on fire, uh, and we don't know the, the cause of the fire, whether it was enemy action or not. Uh, but the aircraft is missing, and so are the crew. They're such super, super young men. Um, I just don't want anything to happen to any of them. And unfortunately, someone's going to have some bad news, aren't they? Great to know that they've got through their first mission without problems. Just hope it will continue that way. It's obviously they're going to fly again. Um, we'll just keep sitting back and waiting for those telephone calls to come. Obviously, I don't think everybody's going to come back, but hopefully almost everybody will come back. And, uh, you know, we can start again there. And as the airstrikes continue, they're all painfully aware it's not over yet. You don't know how you take it if, you know, the man from the MOD shows up on your doorstep. You know, the first thing I'd have to say if I saw the car arrive is, you know, which one is it? Is it Bruce or is it Nick? The family's vowing not to rest until they see Bruce and Nick in the flesh home safe on British soil. Jonathan Marland, Coast to Coast. Well, among the servicemen from the southeast who are in the Gulf are the Royal Engineers, who are based in Kent. It's their job to help defuse the thousands of mines that Saddam Hussein has planted in Kuwait and Iraq. This afternoon, Jim Couchman, the MP for Gillingham, paid tribute to them in the Commons. Couchman. The thoughts and prayers of many of my constituents will be with the sappers serving with our troops in the Gulf, sappers from the Medway towns. Will my right honourable friend seek to reassure them in their anxiety that the courage and superb professionalism of all our troops will contribute to a swift and satisfactory outcome to this conflict which many of us had hoped would never happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, have no, I have no doubt that it will contribute to a successful outcome. I must say to my honourable friend that we should be under no illusions whatsoever about the scale and potential might of the Iraqi forces. Whilst I am confident about the success, I cannot yet be confident about the speed of that success, and I think we should prepare ourselves for that fact. Well, some of the world's leading scientists are tonight warning of an ecological disaster following the outbreak of war in the Gulf. A Kent woman has brought together experts from around the globe who forecast a catastrophe if Kuwaiti oil wells are set ablaze. Clouds of soot thousands of miles across could cause serious disruption to the weather and bring starvation to millions. Hugh Kirby explains. Within hours of war, the nightmare scenes so feared by some of the world's leading scientists, chemists and meteorologists had become reality. Iraqi missiles scored a direct hit on a Saudi oil refinery, sending a cloud of smoke miles into the air. Those experts had been brought together by a Green Party activist from Kent, Penny Kemp. 
She became alarmed three months ago after hearing a speech by King Hussein of Jordan in which he said, this confrontation is taking place on top of the single richest natural petroleum reservoir in the world. A war in the Gulf could lead to an environmental catastrophe. One week ago, Penny Kemp chaired a New York conference to assess the possible environmental damage caused by fires in oil wells. Those attending had the highest qualifications. I think I'd like to point out we're not just talking about f freshers, first-year university students. We're talking about the world's leading atmospheric scientists. Their conclusions are devastating. If Kuwait's 750 oil wells are set ablaze, Clouds of soot more than 25 miles high will begin to spread, covering a vast area of the Middle East and blotting out the sun. They forecast a dramatic fall in temperature, ending any chance of rainfall in a region where water means life. If that happens, you're talking about the lives of billions of people that rely on food production and possibly the failure of the Indian monsoon. Kuwaiti wells had been producing two million barrels of oil a day, over half the world's natural reserves lie underneath the Gulf Desert. Experts say Kuwait could burn for a year as an unknown quantity of soot pours forth. It depends what figures of barrels of oil we're talking about burning. If we take a lower figure, say three million, which is a very, very conservative figure, we could talk about a cloud of soot that would be the, half the size of the United States. The scientists' other nightmare is an oil spill in the shallow waters of the Gulf itself, coupled with the destruction of saltwater purifying plants, the only source of drinking water for 95% of the war-torn Gulf. Hugh Kirby, Coast to Coast. It's a testing time for the families of servicemen in the Gulf, and to help them cope as news of any British casualties come in, a number of organisations are operating telephone helplines and offering counselling. TVS has a special service on Oracle, page 249, giving details of those numbers. We'll keep that service updated throughout the conflict. Philip Hornby has been looking at some of the services now gearing up to help those worried relatives. Aldershot, home of the British Army, where they're coordinating a network of self-help support groups all across the southeast. Volunteers working for the families of service personnel on the first day of war. The phones are going now non-stop. Uh, I think people are now sort of beginning to come to as to what's happened. And as there's more news coming through, I think they're leaving their televisions and coming in and phoning. If there are casualties, army officers, visiting officers, will give the news directly to relatives. And preparations have been going on for months to ensure there's adequate backup. Some people react and get over it fairly quickly and will have their lives reorganised. Others will want a little bit longer counselling and help. On a personal note, how difficult a job is it for you at a time like this? Um, yes, tends to get uh, 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 difficult, I suppose, because you're, um, it can either be the bearer of very sad news, um, but on the other hand, it can also be quite a rewarding experience that you, you're in a position to help someone through what is a very harrowing experience for them. I would see my role in supporting the visiting officers who have to the unenviable task of, of going with what may be very bad news to, to families and uh, to be available to, to um, in the usual role as, as a, a pastor, to offer support and to help them through this particularly tragic, or what may be tragic, time in their lives. Should the worst happen, voluntary services like the Red Cross will play a vital role comforting the bereaved and helping the NHS. The ambulance services expect to deal with the transfer of casualties from Gatwick and possibly from Manston, which is a diversion airport for Gatwick. Um, the Red Cross will nevertheless along with St John, be standing by with its fleet of, their fleet of some 60 vehicles um, to provide backup to the National Health Service if that's what is required. And if relatives need long-term counselling, social services staff will be available. In Kent, their experiences following the Zeebrugge disaster should prove invaluable. What we've done is actually try to draw upon that experience and offer that experience to our military colleagues and we will be making available the computer systems that we develop for the Herald of Free Enterprise disaster so that they can use that to log up information about casualties and families should that need arise.
It's an impressive network of support. The only hope tonight is that it won't be needed. Philip Hornby, Coast to Coast. Well, now some news from the South, End, uh, South Thames Blood Transfusion Service. They say the response to requests for blood has been tremendous. An extra session has been arranged on Sunday between 10 and 4 p.m. at Westgate Hall in St. Peter's Road, Canterbury. The details on our special Gulf Information Service. That's on page 249 of Oracle. And as we've already said, that service will be continually updated. Meanwhile, the situation in the Gulf has led to a surge in inquiries for jobs in the armed forces. Careers offices across the region report large numbers of people saying they only want to join up if they can go to the Gulf. And many of those coming forward were people who served in the Second World War. Richard Brock reports. Normally, there's a steady stream of people interested in joining the Army, Navy or Air Force through the Chatham Recruiting Office. But in recent weeks, there's been a marked increase in the numbers, here and in other offices. The reason? People are keen to do their bit in the Gulf. I think when the general public uh, volunteer like this, it always increases the morale of the uh, servicemen here. And obviously we know a lot of members who are out in the Gulf, and we do speak to them regularly, or when they're home anyway. And I think generally the servicemen are very pleased that the general public is actually backing them in what they're having to do. But most remarkable is the age of some of the people coming forward. A number of veterans of the Second World War. They're willing to help out in this country, but most want to go to the front line. They appear to be genuine and really concerned about what's going on and wanting to help in order to reduce our casualties, if there are any, as much as possible. Is it that they want to get back into the army or it is simply they want to go to the Gulf? I think it's patriotism, really. They, they want to help and they want to go to the Gulf and they realise that um, people in uniform out there are in a dangerous situation uh, and they like to do their bit, really. Members of the older generation say nobody should be surprised at their willingness to help. I would go even at my age. Why? Because I think Saddam's all wrong, wrong to take over a country that doesn't belong to him. Knowing what I know now today, I would, without any hesitation, go. The forces say that while they're grateful for all offers of help, there'll be no extra recruitment because of the Gulf War. Richard Brock, Coast to Coast, Chatham. Now, look at the latest developments in the Gulf before we move on to other news. We do have a live computer link in the Coast to Coast studio. We can update you with world news immediately. Immediately it happens. And uh, just looking in that now, there is a report coming in, uh, which I'd stress is as yet unconfirmed, that some Iraqi soldiers have abandoned their positions in Kuwait City. The Prime Minister has just repeated his assurances in the Commons that the Allies will treat, try to keep civilian casualties in the Gulf to a minimum. And the Ministry of Defence on the subject of that missing tornado they say it was on its way back from a mission when the crew reported an engine on fire and a search is now going on behind enemy lines Liz. well now on to news much closer to home up to 300 jobs are to go at tvs television over the next two years that's about a third of the workforce the company hold the independent television franchise to broadcast programs to the south and southeast but under new government legislation, the franchise is being put out to tender and is likely to go to the highest bidder. TVS say they have to make cuts to compete. Lloyd Bracey reports. TVS have become the latest of the regional companies to cut jobs in preparation for the big changes looming in independent television. Existing broadcast contracts end in 1992 and TVS, along with all the other regional companies, will have to bid for the right to continue broadcasting. They must clear a so-called quality hurdle, and then the lucrative contract will go to the highest bidder. Just being the best won't be enough. That's right. That's why we've got to get the commercial aspect right. Programming, we've got no worries, and it would take a very strong player to come in here and unlodge us from our regional service and our network uh, make. Where we could be dislodged is, uh, is, is at the level of the financial bid. And that's why we've got to make sure that we have no fat left in the company whatsoever from the old system. But job cuts are only one way to save money. TVS have two main production centres, Maidstone and Southampton, both making network and local programmes. The company will concentrate production for the network in one studio. They haven't yet said which, nor just what would happen to the other. But they say the changes won't affect regional services and programmes like Coast to Coast will still be made in both centres. 
James Gatwood is confident the cuts will save TVS the money they need, but how will he say goodbye to old friends? A very, very difficult question to answer. Uh, there is deep regret in the announcements we've made today. Uh, there have been a lot of people who've been tremendously loyal to the company. Uh, that has not gone without notice. Um, we face, as a company, a commercial reality that is going to be 1993 onwards. There is nothing we can do about that. Government legislation has been introduced which forces all attention to that. If TVS were to lose, the company coming in would not face the future in any different way. Well, tonight the unions at TVS said they don't accept the need for immediate compulsory redundancies. Other means of saving money should be explored first. Meanwhile, the latest government figures show a rise of nearly 14% in the jobless total across the southeast. About 90,000 people are out of work in the region. That's one in 20 of the workforce. One result of the current recession is that more and more people are having to borrow money to keep their businesses afloat, and many are turning to pawnbrokers. One in Sussex says his trade is up by 30% because the banks are becoming more reluctant to lend money. Nigel Burwood has this report. This limousine is not taking a successful businessman down to the golf course. It's in the hands of a pawnbroker. Cars are part of a growing list of expensive and unusual items now on the books of this pawn shop in Brighton. Brokers like this are used to handling gold watches and sometimes musical instruments when their owners hit hard times. But now even chainsaws, garden machinery and golf clubs are raising cash for self-employed people whose banks have said no. Builders, developers um, and allied trades to the building trade, people who are producing things for builders and the like, I think they're having a very tough time of it. The service does help a certain uh, proportion of people that um, get uh, overstretched with their credit cards and the banks. The banks are not particularly um, uh, uh, friendly at the moment, I don't think. The reluctance of the banks has meant a 30% increase in the pawnbroker's business over the past six months. But while he's happy to take a rich man's car as security, he's not interested in his mobile telephone. If the chap is uh, in a position that he has to um, pawn his mobile telephone, he's not in a position to pay the bill, and at the end of the time you wind up with a telephone with a long outstanding bill on it. Um, so we've, it's just not worth getting involved. When people redeem their goods, they could be paying interest at an annual rate of 40%. But even so, there's no shortage of customers. Nigel Burwood, Coast to Coast, Brighton. Staff shortages are so severe at a hospital that expectant mothers are being told they'll have to travel 20 miles to have their babies. Administrators at Thanet District Hospital say they haven't got enough midwives to cope. David Forsdyke reports. Maternity services at Thanet District General Hospital have been badly hit. Expectant mothers in East Kent are now being told that to give birth, they'll have to go nearly 20 miles to Canterbury. They're so short of midwives here that safety, they say, has been compromised. There are around 1,500 births a year at this hospital, but concern over patient safety has forced Thanet into telling mothers to go elsewhere. We feel in the interest of safety for the mother and baby that we can no, lo no longer offer that safe service. For the foreseeable future, mothers won't have any choice but to travel 20 miles to Canterbury to give birth. Coming back to Thanet only as postnatal patients. I think it would be awful for the area to shut it. Yeah, I think, you know, all the classes that I've done have been here and everybody's been terrific. I live in Margate and I've got no way of getting there. And then you have to wait for an ambulance, get over there have the baby and then be transferred back to here, which means that rooting you once again. My labours are so quick and there, there wouldn't be enough time to get over there, to tell the truth. There'll still be a partial service for emergency birth at Thanet District, but managers are now telling mothers they'll have to make their own way to Canterbury or get an ambulance at short notice. And in a double blow for the hospital, ambulance crews are also being told not to take serious casualty cases to Thanet. This national directive tells ambulance crews to go to bigger hospitals because they have better care. If they were to ignore the directive and bring a patient to Thanet, we would obviously do the best we could for that patient under the circumstances. Do you think that people are right to be concerned? Because they certainly are. 
I'm sure people are concerned, and I personally am extremely upset. Health officials here are adamant that the cutbacks are in the interests of both casualty patients and nursing mothers. But they also realise that the public's perception is of yet more cutbacks in local hospital services. David Falsdyke, Coast to Coast, Margate. Other news in brief now. Russell Bishop, the Brighton man jailed for life for the attempted murder of a seven-year-old girl, is appealing against his sentence. Bishop's always denied attempting to kill the girl at Devil's Dyke last summer. His appeal petition has been lodged at the High Court in London. A multi-million pound development scheme has been announced for the north of Kent. Dartford Council has earmarked 800 acres of land next to the new bridge across the Thames. Plans include a 180-acre business park, the possible relocation of the Thames Polytechnic, and around 400 new homes. The council hopes that work will start on that scheme early next year. A man has been cleared of killing a North Fleet boy who died after being punched in the face. 16-year-old Jamie Stiles fell and hit his head on the ground after being hit by 25-year-old Stefano Sesto in Gravesend. Mr Sesto from Ipswich denied manslaughter. He told Maidstone Crown Court he hit out in self-defence. An inquest has been opened and adjourned into the death of a man at an Eastbourne hotel. Kenneth Isaacs was found in a room at the Prince's Hotel near the seafront. A post-mortem found he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, now it's time to take a look at all the sports news with Andy Stegel. Thanks, Liz. We start with a footballer who's taking the second division by storm. Brian Wade came to Brighton on a free transfer. Now he's making the opposition pay. Wade hit four against Newcastle. Penny Sylvester has the goals. Wade was released by Swansea and joined Brighton on contract until the end of the season. His first goal just before half-time. In the second half, Newcastle levelled through a Mick Quinn header. And Kevin Brock gave the Geordie side the lead 14 minutes later. But a mistake by the Newcastle defence, and Wade made it 2-2. It's a remarkable achievement for anybody, and uh, for Brian, it was his home debut as well. And I would think a number of the supporters who came here last night uh, didn't know who he was in the first place. They know now. Wade completed his hat trick six minutes from time. And he rounded off a remarkable night with his fourth goal in the last minute. Final score Brighton 4, Newcastle 2. One other item of football news tonight, 4th Division Maidstone have signed midfielder Paul Wimbledon on a month's loan from Shrewsbury Town. Meanwhile, one of Athletic's leading ladies provided ceremonial style today. Olympic javelin star Fatima Whitbread was in Kent to help Medway launch its year of sport. The Sports Council and local authorities have planned a nationwide series of events and coaching courses over the next 12 months. The aim is to encourage more people to get involved in sport. Fatima was joined at today's opening ceremony at Rochester Castle by another gold medalist, Bob Matthews, the blind runner from Strood. And that's it from sport. Back to Mike. Thanks, Andy. Time for the weather forecast now, and uh, Ron Lobeck is poised, waiting with the details, Ron. Yes, thanks very much, as ever. Poised, yes. Good evening. Well, temperatures got up to about 7 Celsius today, and the good news is that the frost has disappeared for the next couple of days. There's been, obviously, some rain around, and taking a look at the satellite sequence, we can see the reason for that rain. It's the frontal system one was talking about last night that's edging towards us and gradually going to be taking that rain away into the continent. But there is another system brewing up down in the southwest which is going to bring rain in over the weekend. This is the front that's around at the moment. It's going to be fairly slow to clear away towards the continent and uh, behind it the air is fairly moist coming in off the fairly warm Atlantic but that's the low that's going to be developing and bringing more rain back up into the southwest during tomorrow so that by noon tomorrow that rain the second belt of rain will be appearing winds will be strengthening across the south and that rain will be advancing towards us tonight temperatures will get down to about six Celsius the rain will hang around for a while over East Kent but gradually during the night brighter weather will appear across Sussex and that brighter weather will spread slowly eastwards during the night. The winds themselves will swing more west or southwesterly. 
Tomorrow, temperatures will get up to about 8, so it'll feel quite mild in this southwesterly airstream. It'll be fairly cloudy across the region for most of the day. There will be some little bursts of sunshine around, I think, but rain will start to appear in West Sussex during the early afternoon and will gradually spread across the region during the latter part of the afternoon and through into tomorrow night. Looking ahead then, the weekend looks as though it'll be a mixture of some rain and then Sunday it should settle down to a fairly mild and sunny day. Picture tonight, well, it comes from Shepway Junior School, where I spent some time with the children this morning. It's from Rachel Lake. Back to Liz. Well, a recap on the main news in the southeast tonight. Two Sussex men were tornado pilots taking part in the bombing of Iraq. Their family learned they were safe when they saw them on TV. An international expert on the ecological effects of the war, Kent woman Penny Kemp, has warned it could cause famine. TVS is to shed up to 300 staff over the next two years, about a third of the workforce. The company says it must slim down to compete for its franchise. Finally, children at schools across the region have been praying for the safety of servicemen and women in the Gulf. Mary Garn joined the assembly at one junior school. Peace, Most of these children are too young to understand what's really happening in the Gulf, but they offered up their prayers for peace and for those fighting the war. We're here to think about it and to remember uh, those soldiers and sailors and, 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 and airmen of ours who are out in the Gulf at this moment. <coughs> what are they fighting for? Well, perhaps when you grow up, you'll realize um, they're fighting to overcome an evil. Head teacher Peter Harrington is a former major in the army. He used the story of Pandora's box to remind the children about evil in the world and about hope. A group of 10 and 11 year olds shared their thoughts on the news of war. My father told me about it this morning. He said, we, we're now at war because, of, because we went and tried to kill Saddam Hussein type of thing. It was frightening, but I knew that Saddam Hussein would try and come bomb us because he hasn't got the guts. It's, it's silly because there shouldn't really be a war and millions of people are going to die, so I think they are. Well, I think that Saddam Hussein is just totally in the wrong and he just doesn't realise it. He's just being so stupid about the whole thing. He should just get out of Q8. And finally, a song for peace. Well, that's all from us for now. Mike will be back with you after the news at 10. Now I hand you back to the studios of ITN for the latest on the Gulf.